Javed Alam, a known Marxist scholar, has taught political science at Himachal Pradesh University, Shimla, for the past 20 years. He is ICSSR Senior Fellow at the Centre for the Study of Developing Societies, Delhi. Javed Alam has given a serious thought to modernity in Indian context. The most pertinent social, economic and political issues confronting India today center around the question of modernity. How can the country work towards a viable future without being homogenized by the dominant version of modernity, which is but a handmaiden of capitalist global drives? Are the indices of modernity that we use to measure ourselves against capable of bringing about preferred futures in relation to our heritage and practices? And what kind of ethical choices are entailed in living according to particular versions of modernity? Javid Alam has discussed all these questions and issues in his latest book, India, Living with Modernity, published by Oxford University Press. In this book, Javed Alam seeks to untangle the complex and often contradictory trajectories of modernity. He suggests new ways of approaching modernity which are emancipatory rather than oppressive and may help in the struggle for a more equitable and just society both within the country and in the wider world. For anyone interested in secularism, nationality and the dynamics of third world societies under increasing threat from globalized capitalist economies, this is a vital and very important book. invited Javed Alam and Savita Singh to discuss the book India Living with Modernity. I'm pleased to tell you that this book has introduced a set of new arguments in the discourse, in the ongoing discourse of modernity in India. I have been myself a very keen student of modernity as you know. Tell me, as a Marxist, how have you, how have you come up, say, for example, uh, to realize that the context is extremely important in understanding the implications of Western modernity? Uh, let me make two initial points. Yeah. I think the entire debate in the last few years, uh, for and against modernity, both. Uh, has got trapped into a certain kind of a very limited uh, area. Uh, particularly the defense of modernity by Marxists, I think, is trapped in the term set by the opponents. Yes. Which in the sense that everyone has come out to defend in the name of modernity enlightenment. And I think the entire philosophy of enlightenment is something which cannot go along with Marxism for two very important reasons. One, the two major philosophers of enlightenment are John Locke and Descartes. Mm -hmm. Both John Locke and Descartes, the thought, the philosophical th thought is foundational. And foundationalism, I think, is something 
which is an independent principle outside of everything through which you can criticize everything, but which itself cannot be critiqued. Now, given this particular fact, I think Marxism makes a very important point that everything in history in the process of becoming is negated. They call it the law of negation of negation. Yes. Now, if everything is negated, there cannot be anything foundational, because foundationalism is outside everything. Now, this is something which gave me the idea that the Marxist defense of modernity against the attack from or the critiques from people post, post structuralist, post modernist like Foucault or Derrida and all has got caught in the trap set by them. And therefore, it is very important to have a fresh look at the problem. And that is where I started examining mm -hmm. the whole philosophical foundations, the philosophical presuppositions of enlightenment philo philosophy, which I have considered in, in my book that what we call the dominant form of modernity is in some kind, some ways is the embodied form of enlightenment. And this is what led me to raise the first initial questions of what is wrong with our defense as mm -hmm. radical thinkers mm -hmm. of the kind of modernity which but we have does inherited. It, does it make a difference? Because I personally think that <coughs> uh, till very recently, it was, it was not uh, considered any, uh, uh, any, I mean it was not considered problematic to accept enlightenment project as legitimate for a Marxist project, a Marx Marxist agenda of a progressive understanding of history or modernity for, for that matter. What is that led you to, to reconsider, reopen or s close some of the boundaries for example, close some areas uh, as you as you as you are, as you are telling telling me that you know you are facing closures, you are facing dead ends. Yeah. What, See, what was it that allowed you to open it up uh, in the way that you have done? That is, you have, you have, you have understood the need and necessity of being modern in India, not modern as such, but being a modern Indian. That is the real problem that you are facing, is not it? Yeah, let me put it uh, in, in a way where we can look at in enlightenment in two different ways here. See, enlightenment as a historical project entails certain set of values, uh, values of the autonomy of the person, the notion of the dignity of the individual, the whole question of the equality of people, the individual as a right bearing uh, person. Now, all of these particular values that are entailed in enlightenment are something which I have no particular quarrel with. But I have a problem and the problem is that all the philosophical underpinnings, the, the presuppositions of enlightenment are something where an uh, emancipatory project, uh, where the humanity as a collective subject cannot be an actor within that. Uh, it is because A, the whole philosophical idea of enlightenment is around an atomistic individual, a notion of self, which is a disengaged self, it is a bare empty self. It neither is a carrier of any kind of a heritage, nor it is constituted by the practices within which individuals are uh, engaged, the ways in which they exert together. Now, all of this is something which is not reconcilable with the philosophical presuppositions of enlightenment. Now, this is precisely where I have a very serious problem, that any emancipatory project, any radical kind of an advance towards uh, human beings coming to terms with themselves coming out of the kind of world which is full of domination, full of exploitation, becoming in a way a collectively autonomous, free of all of these things, is something which would require a very major kind of an emancipatory project. And that to me is not conceivable within the philosophical presuppositions of enlightenment, which is deeply Cartesian, which is deeply Lockean, which is foundational. Yes. And therefore, I thought that we got to re-examine the problem. And in re-examining the problem, it seemed to me that there are within what one may call uh, philosophical resources within modern thought itself, which remain untapped, which remain unembodied in history. At its very source. At the very point of initiation yes. of, let us say, the modern mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I think notions where you can conceive of self not as disengaged, not as a bare self not as an empty self, self as a part of a heritage. You can conceive of the person uh, uh, as not you know, constituted by consciousness, 
that self is equal to consciousness is the kind of thing which has had a long meaning in Western met metaphysics from Plato to mm -hmm. Descartes and he Hegel. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it is also possible to look at uh, the initial moment where you have a notion of self which is not associated simply with consciousness. That the whole problem of the dichotomy between mind and body, which is so very central to the Cartesian project, uh, is, is, is something which can be overcome. Like for example, in the writings of Spinoza, I find that mind itself is body animated. So that particular dichotomy, that mm. Manichaean tradition of Western philosophy, which is so full of dichotomies. And once you accept this particular dichotomy of mind and body, then you accept a series of dichotomies which are born out of it, between reason and emotion, between is and ought, and so on and so forth. And it goes on. Mm -hmm. Now, it is a kind of a thought which I think is something where which can be very easily overcome within what you call the modern philosophical tradition itself. And that is available within the Western thought. And this I have called. Uh, I, in fact, uh, have called it the untapped surplus, yes. which we can go back to. And then in terms of our own situations, mm -hmm. can re-examine it, can see what is possible. But you know, Javed, this is hardly Marxist. This is very, very hermeneutical. I mean, I am simply surprised why would you not mention in your project or acknowledge the importance, tremendous importance for this kind of project, names like Heidegger, or Gadamer, or even Charles Taylor. You use Charles Taylor's book, Sources of the Self. Y in fact, you even uh, uh, take this position that Charles Taylor takes, that there are possibilities within the Western tradition for numerous possibilities of new articulations of modernity. This is very, very Taylorian argument, you know. And for this to become possible in Indian context, for example, one is inevitably placed within a communitarian discourse. And I think that's where you've taken this discourse in India. One of my major concerns within this is whether one can reconstitute the project of modernity historically in the present context. And within that, to me, the resources that seem much more important were other than Heidegger or Gadamer. I mean, that was my way of reading it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I thought that Marx gives to me uh, far more resources than anybody else. Uh, let me take uh, one particular instance from the book and why I think the resources that Marx give are for me much more, why I consider them to be much more important. I have talked of secularism, I have talked of uh, nationalism, I have talked of rationality, I have talked of self-consciousness and all of this. Uh, let me take one particular thing, nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been recently much debated uh, in many, many different ways. It has been talked of as something which homogenizes. It is the part of what you call the capitalist project of normalizing cultures and mm -hmm. societies and communities. Uh, I think when we look at a little more carefully at this whole problem, we find, for example, that nationalism as, a, as an ideology is something which is very restrictive. But if you look at the very foundations of nationalism, the philosophical basis of nationalism, it is built essentially a on the in the 17th, 18th century on the rising national awareness of the people, and this awareness of the people is coterminous with the with the democratic awareness which was coming about in Western societies. It is through this awareness that people were coming to recognize themselves as autonomous, as as persons who need to be recognized, whose culture that they represent ought to be demarcated as different from others. Now, this was something, this awareness as the democratic content. Number two, that this awareness demanded that there should be equality among people, that no one particular culture, no one particular nation should dominate as the empires at that time would dominate. Now, these were two very important elements. The third element within nationalism was that of, in some ways, privileging one's own nation privileging one's own community. Now, it is precisely here, I think, when nationalism congeals as an ideology. It congeals in terms of the practices surrounding it. And I think of the practices surrounding it, the material practices are, some, are the most important. Uh, the compulsions generated by these material practices allows or uh, lead to a certain way of the crystallization of that particular ideology. Now, it was the struggle of the bourgeoisie 
it was the struggle of the cl capitalist class which was trying to come to ca capture the state and the become the representative. This particular struggle of the capitalists made the this entire nationalism to congeal as an ideology simply in terms of privileging one's own nation. The other democratic elements went down. And I think this whole idea of the material practices and the compulsion generated out of those which lead to one or another form of the crystallization of an ideology, how it gets congealed is a resource which I thought is available to me only within uh, or much more within Marxism than in any other ideology. It is fine. Marxism provides you, it allows you to look into, for example, say uh, a, liberal, uh, a liberal position may not be so inclined to take up uh, cases of peasant rebellion, for example, to write a history of Indian nationalism. I could, I mean, I can, I can see that. As a Marxist, you could, you could very, very easily see that the democratic element that creeps into or that comes into the formation of India as a nation, the contribution of peasants, contribution of working class is very much there. I mean, this is, uh, this is very, very clear. The problem here is of posing the question of modernity the discourse of modernity itself, how it has to be. I mean, you could have taken a very standard Marxist position, which had been taken so far, and you could have still landed up with the same resources. I simply want to know why, what, what, I mean, the, the interpretive, the hermeneutical positions, the positions, even the postmodernist positions, have they not impressed you in some way or the other uh, to actually look, to get, to look, to sort of have an interior look, to, inter to look inwardly towards your own practices and cultures and pose question of modernity in this new context. This is the whole issue. Now, uh, what, what you are asking is precisely the kind of problem that confronted me yeah. in, in one way. Uh, if I were to ask, why did one particular form of modernity become entrenched, what I have called entrenched modernity, yeah. why did it become the dominant form? When there was so much within what you call the modern thought, why was that one particular thing became uh, congealed as the ideology, as the doctrine of modernity? Why was a lot of it left out, remained an untapped surplus? Now, if I were to ask that, the only way that I could answer that particular question was that that pretty the presuppositions of this uh, entrenched modernity, the Cartesian philosophical outlook, the Lockean, and then as it grows through Kant and others is something which I thought that those prepositions were in close affinity with the philosophical basis of capitalism. Capitalism as much uh, looks at the human self as a bare self, as, as an empty self. Mm -hmm. Its whole notion of rationality is deeply instrumental. It has no content to it in the sense in which, let us say, in the pre-modern area when we talk of reason. Mm -hmm. The reason was a carrier of something more than in more than a procedural way of doing things. See, it may also be something, you know, which contains a, 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 a cosmic vision. Uh, it may also contain something of a historical project within it. Now, why did it get entrenched? Now, this is where I thought that these preposition, presuppositions of philosophical presuppositions of modernity and the uh, assumptions of capitalism are in close affinity. Also, for example, capitalism will separate the spheres of politics from that of economics, economics from that of moral concerns, that each has nothing to do with the other. This is very Weberian. Uh, Weber has made it very, very clear to yeah, us. Yeah, but then yeah. it is the, the, the whole heritage mm. of what you call capital, mm. capitalism as so or bourgeois you philosophies. To, are you trying to make a point that it, the, in the way that you have posed or you have critiqued the entrenched moder modernity, it has also allowed you a very advantageous position. You find yourself in an advantageous position to critique capitalism in a new way. That is to say, it's the same rationality that informs both. That is, the entrenched modernity, the enlightened project, and the uh, uh, rationality, which is important for uh, profit making and capitalism. And what there is a particular term that you use, productive uh, rationality. Is that right? So you think both of them are sort of they are, they've worked together. They've been sustained by each other. And without capitalism, this particular entrenched modernity could not, could have given in, couldn't, couldn't have become so dominant, could have given in to other forms of modernity. I wouldn't say they are the same, All but right. I, I would say they are in close affinity. All right. For example, 
within the rationality of modernity, there is also available the whole notion of critique, for example. And it is only within modernity that for the first time, critique becomes available to the entire society. It does not remain a privilege of a, a group of philosophers, like earlier. It becomes a part of the popular culture. And it is in terms of that part of the popular critique becoming a part of the popular understanding, that what one may call an emancipatory project, a praxis becomes possible as well, where, let us say, the mm -hmm exploited people can become the subject of history. Uh, in that particular sense, there is uh, affinity, but there is also something more to the rationality of modernity than that and of capitalism. Capitalism, yes. capitalism is, mm -hmm. in one way, if we look at it today, that it is this critique which gives rise to uh, a large number of emancipatory projects, uh, including Marxism. It is also this critique, when we look at it within liberal philosophy, we also find that in the recent period, the development of the liberal philosophy is becoming increasingly justice sensitive, if we read, read people like yes. Rawls, Rawls or Charles yeah. Taylor and mm -hmm. many others. Whereas capitalism is moving in a very different trajectory. That that trajectory is sensitivity to, uh, to, to productive efficiency. And this whole question, other questions completely go out of it. So there is an affinity, but there is not an identity. There is a, 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 a there is something more to the rationality of modernity. In but you do make a which, point. Yeah, that which makes it corrigible as yeah, well. Of course, it makes it corrigible, and that you have also also mentioned very clearly. You've written that it has sustained this particular kind of entrenched modernity, the capitalist without capitalist um, market and without capitalist uh, need of instrumental rationality, this uh, instrumental rationality in as part of the enlightenment project would not have sustained itself. Yeah. People had, would have resisted new forms, other forms of modernities would have been articulated. Yeah, right. much more easily, more, much more if easy, not yes. for the overwhelming presence yeah. of capitalism. I mean, it would be much more easy to move towards other forms of modernity, that those trajectories mm -hmm. within which emancipatory projects can be easily built in. Mm -hmm. But it is because of the overwhelming presence of capitalism yeah. that you cannot come out of what I have called entrenched modernity, a modernity. Mm -hmm. This is where your Marxist position comes in. I think this is exactly where you want to retain this particular point. You want to retain this particular edge over and above the postmodernist and post-structuralist and so on and so forth. See, I right? wanted to understand the problem as completely as it was possible for me. Mm -hmm. It is not that I want to retain it. It takes me into that particular way of looking at the problem. Not that I want to retain it. Mm -hmm. Because if my investigation were to show mm -hmm. that it is something which has to be shed, I would like to shed it. Of course. But you my have investigation indeed done it. Mm -hmm. Some parts you have done it. For example, uh, the very fact that you want to approach, you want an openness through your arguments. You open in each chapter, you open some ground. You don't close. I mean, you wouldn't straight away go and say uh, that a progressive view of history or dialectical notion of history would automatically take care of capitalism and all that. That kind of position, I think, is not sustainable anymore. Is that right? Yes, quite right, yes. Yeah. And uh, the other thing that comes out very nicely in your book is that like many uh, hermeneut hermeneutical, posi hermeneutical positions and like many postmodernists, you also believe that through contest, many positions will come up. Yes, I think. I and think contestation is extremely important. I think it? today there is no particular claim yeah. which can say that it, it has a certain universality to itself yeah. in the manner in which enlightenment philosophy is yeah. claimed. I think every claim has has something uh, can contest itself, can yeah. claim even a Even Marxism, even Marxism will have to. I think it will have to win the time, battle yeah. in terms of popular contests, mm -hmm. that you can't take it for granted or you can't make an a priori claim that something necessarily is mm -hmm. universal. Mm -hmm. So there might be things in a culture which were never earlier recognized, which and, and those cultures can make, make claims of being universal. And I also think it is very important when different cultures are now for the first time struggling to uh, interact on, a, on levels of equality. I think for a thing to be esteemed, it is also not necessary that it ought to be a universal, mm -hmm. uh, something of a universal. I think a lot of claims can coexist without necessarily asserting any kind of a uh, universality about that. So I think it is very important for us to come out with that particular kind of a phase mm -hmm. which started with enlightenment, where once you make a claim, all other claims, all contrary claims ought to be rejected because they are not in 
uh, in congruence with what was claimed to be a certain kind of a rationality. Mm. But I think this is a very, um, it's a very welcome position, Javed. It's a really democratic position, frankly speaking. I mean, not taking a priori importance, not justifying a theory over and above other theories as scientific, and that is why much more important and much more predictable and with a greater value on their telos than other theories. This is really a post postmodern time in which even Marxist position, for example, has to find a new bearing, has to find a new way of proving itself as worthwhile, for example. But yeah. but in, in this new context, what happens to to its revolutionary agenda, for example? I don't see what happens. The revolutionary agenda remains. The revolutionary agenda cannot claim any uh, a priori supremacy over anything else. It will have to win the understanding of the people. It will have to become accepted by the people. The people themselves will have to become a part of that. With this kind of understanding, you proceed to analyze the formation of Indian state, the, the formation of Indian nationalism, the present problem that we have uh, of, of com communal problem in the society, the importance of rights and the language of rights, and absolute individuation, the word, the term that you use, which guarantees individuals right to life, a very Habesian, uh, you know, way of putting it. But, uh, I mean, if all these things that you want as part of the fu preferred future for India as, as a modern, as a modern uh, society, in this kind of uh, new preferred future that India will have, what kind of state, what kind of society um, do you do you think would would be viable? See, viable in the sense would be modern and viable, of course. I can quickly make one or two points as All we right. are running out of time. I think I was quite amazed to see in the most unlikely places the deep logical influence of what I call the Cartesian thought. Mm -hmm. Thinkers like Vivekananda, for example, mm -hmm. whom one would least think of, I think are deeply influenced by the Cartesian notion of indubitable truth. And by that particular notion of indubitable truth, you can override all other claims to truth. So on the face of it, you know, he's a person who is talking of all religions being true, but mm -hmm. he puts criterial properties to the mm -hmm. establishment of truth, which is no different from Cartesian. Mm -hmm. For example, unless a particular prophetic understanding is seen through what he calls the yogic principle, it can always lead to hallucination or superstition, for example. This is almost like the Cartesian cogito. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, this is a problem which I found pervades the entire thinking about everything in India, even religious thought, thought about culture and tradition, about nation. For example, it is very interesting, somebody like Nehru, who so much valorizes diversity, who is so very a thinker of enlightenment who talks of nation being a modern concept, something which comes with, with, with modernity. Throughout the discovery of India, we find that he is all the time talking of Indian exceptionalism, that India is different. It has been a nation from antiquity, that whenever at whatever time in history you see it, it was there. This is one particular kind of a thing that there is this exception. But the other important point is, there is a acritical acceptance of the particular kind of conceptions that emerged in the West. There is no effort to examine the very varied contexts within which what you call the idea of a nation has got de refracted in Indian society. So what I find that the logical structures of thinking in India, whether about culture, about nation, about tradition, are quite the same as that which were in, in, in the Enlightenment philosophy. This was a very unconscious kind of an acceptance, unconscious taking over of what emerged there. Mm -hmm. And I think that for an authentic kind of a struggle within which you share everything with humanity and yet you are able to work out your own ways, by which I don't mean there is, that India is, is a unique society, that not the kind of argument which a lot of uh, contemporary, uh, I think, very restrictive Gandhians are advancing. But I think India shares with humanity everything that human beings are capable of. Well, Javed, you have brought uh, me to a very, very interesting, I mean, this is not the point where one should end. In fact, this is the point where should one should, in fact, carry on. 
but we we are running short of time thank you so much for coming and you know enlightening us if i can use if you permit me to use this word uh, um, about indian modernity obviously the discourse of modernity in india is a, is is an open discourse and people like javed and others are always welcome to add to it and help us in becoming more democratic secular rational human beings as modern indians thank you very much thank you